The findings suggest that the last ice age was significantly colder than scientists thought, and that matters today. The reason that you know, we want to know how cold the last ice age is, beyond the fact that it's just a cool thing to know, uh, is that we can actually use it to understand a quantity called climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is a measure of how much the planet warms in response to rising greenhouse gases. In this long ago case, we know how much carbon dioxide concentrations increased between the last ice age and pre-industrial period from air bubbles trapped in ancient ice. And now we have Tierney's new results on the temperature difference between glacial and interglacial conditions. Together, these data suggest that low-end estimates of climate sensitivity, in which greenhouse gases don't cause much warming, are unlikely to be correct. If we had low climate sensitivity, then, then we would be less worried about you know, what all the CO2 emissions are going to do. Uh, and so we can kind of rule those, those that possibility out. You know, I suppose that's, that's, that's not great news. The findings suggest that the last ice age was significantly colder than scientists thought, and that matters today. The reason that you know, we want to know how cold the last ice age is, beyond the fact that it's just a cool thing to know, uh, is that we can actually use it to understand a quantity called climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is a measure of how much the planet warms in response to rising greenhouse gases. In this long ago case, we know how much carbon dioxide concentrations increased between the last ice age and pre-industrial period from air bubbles trapped in ancient ice. And now we have Tierney's new results on the temperature difference between glacial and interglacial conditions. Together, these data suggest that low-end estimates of climate sensitivity, in which greenhouse gases don't cause much warming, are unlikely to be correct. If we had low climate sensitivity, then, then we would be less worried about you know, what all the CO2 emissions are going to do. Uh, and so we can kind of rule those, those that possibility out. You know, I suppose that's, that's, that's not great news. So we obviously don't have thermometers in the glacial period, so we have to instead look for these kinds of stand-in indicators. One kind of stand-in is plankton that lived in the ocean and got preserved in marine sediments. Scientists use these fossils to infer past ocean temperatures by studying changes in the chemistry of their shells and in the kinds of fats and other compounds they produced. Tierney and her team then combine these data with a climate model to give a full picture of glacial conditions. It's actually a technique used every day in weather forecasting. What's new is we're using it for the past, not the future, so we're actually, you know, hindcasting, if you will, rather than forecasting. The study is in the journal Nature. So we obviously don't have thermometers in the glacial period, so we have to instead look for these kinds of stand-in indicators. One kind of stand-in is plankton that lived in the ocean and got preserved in marine sediments. Scientists use these fossils to infer past ocean temperatures by studying changes in the chemistry of their shells and in the kinds of fats and other compounds they produced. Tierney and her team then combine these data with a climate model to give a full picture of glacial conditions. It's actually a technique used every day in weather forecasting. What's new is we're using it for the past, not the future, so we're actually, you know, hindcasting, if you will, rather than forecasting. The study is in the journal Nature.
How much colder was it at the peak of the last ice age? That's a question scientists have been trying to answer for decades. And now they have a new best guess, 11 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot, especially considering it's a global average. Parts of North America were much colder. First of all, large areas of the Northeast were completely under ice, so that would have been pretty chilly. You wouldn't be living there. Uh, but even here in the West, right, where we weren't covered by an ice sheet, it would have been something like 20 degrees Fahrenheit lower. Jessica Tierney, a paleoclimatologist at the University of Arizona. Tierney and her colleagues spent years compiling information about Earth's climate at the height of the last glacial period, about 20,000 years ago. How much colder was it at the peak of the last ice age? That's a question scientists have been trying to answer for decades. And now they have a new best guess, 11 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot, especially considering it's a global average. Parts of North America were much colder. First of all, large areas of the Northeast were completely under ice, so that would have been pretty chilly. You wouldn't be living there. Uh, but even here in the West, right, where we weren't covered by an ice sheet, it would have been something like 20 degrees Fahrenheit lower. Jessica Tierney, a paleoclimatologist at the University of Arizona. Tierney and her colleagues spent years compiling information about Earth's climate at the height of the last glacial period, about 20,000 years ago. Think of the sun as the center of a vinyl record, with the planets strung out along the grooves. In contrast, Bayes' team discovered that the stars in this triple star system are ringed by clouds of dust in multiple warped and misaligned planes. Picture a three-dimensional gyroscope rather than a two-dimensional vinyl record. The observations are in the journal Science. Those rings of dust will presumably go on to form planets as the star system matures, and Bay says astronomers have indeed observed other, more mature star systems with planets orbiting in these misaligned planes. And we wanted to understand if that happens at the time those planets were born, or it is some evolutionary thing over you know, a billion years. The findings suggest that weirdly aligned planetary systems are born that way, and that stars in their embryonic planets can be all topsy-turvy, even in their infancy. Think of the sun as the center of a vinyl record, with the planets strung out along the grooves. In contrast, Bayes' team discovered that the stars in this triple star system are ringed by clouds of dust in multiple warped and misaligned planes. Picture a three-dimensional gyroscope rather than a two-dimensional vinyl record. The observations are in the journal Science. Those rings of dust will presumably go on to form planets as the star system matures, and Bay says astronomers have indeed observed other, more mature star systems with planets orbiting in these misaligned planes. And we wanted to understand if that happens at the time those planets were born, or it is some evolutionary thing over you know, a billion years. The findings suggest that weirdly aligned planetary systems are born that way, and that stars in their embryonic planets can be all topsy-turvy, even in their infancy. Yeah, it's really, really young. Yeah, it's a baby. Bay says if you translate that million-year lifespan to that of a human, it's the equivalent of a week-old baby. And how many week-old babies do you bump into? If you just walk around your neighborhood, there's really little chance that you meet a baby who is one week old, right? So first of all, it's hard to find these systems. They are pretty rare. Bay and his colleagues got lucky spotting this one. Using radio telescopes, they were able to image the star system, and they say it differs from our own solar system in more than just star count. In our solar system, for example, all eight planets orbit the sun more or less in a single plane. Yeah, it's really, really young. Yeah, it's a baby. Bay says if you translate that million-year lifespan to that of a human, it's the equivalent of a week-old baby. And how many week-old babies do you bump into? If you just walk around your neighborhood, there's really little chance that you meet a baby who is one week old, 
right? So first of all, it's hard to find these systems. They are pretty rare. Bay and his colleagues got lucky spotting this one. Using radio telescopes, they were able to image the star system, and they say it differs from our own solar system in more than just star count. In our solar system, for example, all eight planets orbit the sun more or less in a single plane. Our solar system is far from the only way to put together stars and their planets. If you look at all the stars in our galaxy, in the Milky Way, right, more than a half of the stars are formed in multiples, meaning that there are more than one star in a system. Astrophysicist Jehan Bay of the Carnegie Institution for Science. He has studied one of those systems with three stars. It's called GW Orionis, and it's freshly formed, only a million years old. Our solar system is far from the only way to put together stars and their planets. If you look at all the stars in our galaxy, in the Milky Way, right, more than a half of the stars are formed in multiples, meaning that there are more than one star in a system. Astrophysicist Jehan Bay of the Carnegie Institution for Science. He has studied one of those systems with three stars. It's called GW Orionis, and it's freshly formed, only a million years old. When restaurants first shut down early in the pandemic, Americans raided grocery stores. They started cooking more at home and presumably generating more leftovers. Those leftovers can be a convenient future meal, but they've also got a dark side. There's a tendency that if you put an item on the plate that's a leftover, there's a higher probability that you're not going to fully consume that item. And so it's probably going to go to waste. Brian Rowe, an applied economist at The Ohio State University. He and his colleagues recently studied leftovers and food waste by tracking the eating habits of 18 men and women in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. When restaurants first shut down early in the pandemic, Americans raided grocery stores. They started cooking more at home and presumably generating more leftovers. Those leftovers can be a convenient future meal, but they've also got a dark side. There's a tendency that if you put an item on the plate that's a leftover, there's a higher probability that you're not going to fully consume that item. And so it's probably going to go to waste. Brian Rowe, an applied economist at The Ohio State University. He and his colleagues recently studied leftovers and food waste by tracking the eating habits of 18 men and women in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The findings are in the journal PLOS One. Overall, Rose says one bigger lesson emerged on how to avoid scraping perfectly good food into the trash. So for us, the real take-home here was choose a smaller meal and you're less likely to generate leftovers. And that's a good thing because leftovers, all else equal, tend to be wasted more often. Not that Roe doesn't have a few aspirational Tupperware sitting around. I'm guilty of this as well. We have stuff left over from last Thanksgiving sitting around in our freezer. And I know people who have moved with frozen items before, <laughs> never getting around to actually eating. The findings are in the journal PLOS One. Overall, Rose says one bigger lesson emerged on how to avoid scraping perfectly good food into the trash. So for us, the real take-home here was choose a smaller meal and you're less likely to generate leftovers. And that's a good thing because leftovers, all else equal, tend to be wasted more often. Not that Roe doesn't have a few aspirational Tupperware sitting around. I'm guilty of this as well. We have stuff left over from last Thanksgiving sitting around in our freezer. And I know people who have moved with frozen items before, <laughs> never getting around to actually eating. The study is in the journal Nature Communications. In the future, Darcy says, a brick wall could potentially serve a dual purpose, providing structural support and storing electricity generated from renewable energy sources like solar panels. The technology is still at least a few years away from being ready for the commercial market. Right now, the energy storage capacity of the bricks is still pretty low, about 1% of a lithium-ion battery. The team is now testing ways to improve brick performance because it looks like you can teach an old brick new tricks.
The study is in the journal Nature Communications. In the future, Darcy says, a brick wall could potentially serve a dual purpose, providing structural support and storing electricity generated from renewable energy sources like solar panels. The technology is still at least a few years away from being ready for the commercial market. Right now, the energy storage capacity of the bricks is still pretty low, about 1% of a lithium-ion battery. The team is now testing ways to improve brick performance because it looks like you can teach an old brick new tricks. 